Hello and welcome back, Royal Family. This will be the last message of the month, the last message of the year. 12-29-22 is your date. 12-29-22 is your date. Your title is Find a Rhythm Within Your Bible Study. This came to me, this title, and it was putting the notes together, and it just made complete sense as to where the Spirit has been leading me recently, um, especially when you get into the two power options, which I brought up a lot in the last probably six months or so. And I just feel like it keeps popping up in my notes. God, the Holy Spirit keeps pressing it on my heart. So um, this actually goes so well with exactly what I've been talking about and uh, getting into. If I look a little tired, I had to jump out of bed this morning to answer some phone calls. There are flights changing and being canceled all over the place down here in Florida. I think all over. Um, and you guys know this weekend is my weekend where I marry my son. It's his wedding and I'm going to be up there marrying him in Orlando and this family coming and a little chaotic <laughs> to say the least. So I'm going to say this in advance. I will not be teaching Sunday. My best bet is to be back on Tuesday in my home here in the studio teaching. But there may be a chance I'm going to teach from a hotel room on Tuesday uh, or Tuesday or Wednesday. If I'm able to stay a little longer and visit with family and help people out or whatever the situation is. Right now, I should be back on track Tuesday, but there is no um, Sunday message. And don't be shocked if next Tuesday, late in the day, the message goes up and I'm filming out of a uh, condo or a hotel or something like that. So I think that's all I have to say. Today's lesson is 1 Thessalonians lesson number 32, lesson 32 of our study to the letters of the church at Thessalonica. 12, 29, 22 is your date. Your title is Find a Rhythm Within Your Bible Study. And keep in mind, I will be off this Sunday. I will be back to teach and do the Lord's Supper next Tuesday, January 3rd. Hopefully, if all goes well, be safe. Enjoy your new year. Happy New Year. Uh, celebrate this weekend with family and friends, those you love and respect, and be safe. Please, be safe. I'm going to pray for that in our opening prayer. I don't have anything else to say. I want to jump into it because I've got a busy day to finish packing up little things here and there and booting up the highway. We actually picked my sister up from the airport today in a few hours. So it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word, so that by it you may grow, I may grow. We all grow in respect to our salvation. In order to grow up, you want to take in the Word of God, the mind of Christ, habitually, Bible doctrine, habitually. Make it a regular practice in your life. In doing so, make sure you have your Christ-like nature, your Christ mind on, filling power of the Holy Spirit. Name and sight any known sin, believer, 1 John 1, 8, 9, and 10. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, the truth is not in us. 1 John 1, 9, believers, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, his word is not in us. Let's get ready to take in the word of God, most important thing we do. I appreciate the prayers for this weekend, for my son's wedding and my family and friends gathering here in Orlando. And I'll keep you guys in prayer. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have to come and study your word. And Father, this coming weekend is the opening of a new year, the ending of one year, the opening of another year. Father, we're asking for safety. We're asking for joy, peace, and love amongst family and friends this weekend. I'm asking for your hand to be on this wedding this weekend for my son, my family and friends, a circle of family and friends I'll be spending the weekend, the long weekend with. And Father, I'm asking you to reach out and touch those Believers that have been supporting this ministry this, this, during the course of this weekend, at the end of the year, the beginning of a new year. And give them the enlightenment, give them the joy and the peace and the comfort in their heart, knowing you're working in their life 
and that they're going to have this relaxed time with their family and friends, that perhaps they can speak of the gospel and speak of Bible doctrine and have that fellowship, and that they open up this new year with hope, faith, and strength going forward, no matter what's facing us. Hope, faith, and strength going forward. We're asking all these things through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's jump into it. Find that rhythm in your Bible study, believer. You can tell it's still in the morning. I'm sipping my coffee. So open back up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 9 this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where we left off, verse 9. Please be safe, New Year's. No matter what you do, don't go out in any crazy crowds. Be amongst people you respect and love. And enjoy yourselves. 1 Thessalonians 2 9. <clears throat> Excuse me. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our labor and hardship, Paul writes, it was by working night and day, so as not to be a burden to any of you, that we proclaim to you the gospel of God. See, the Apostle Paul always made sure the new churches, the new believers, understood he was a man of character and integrity. And that was, he was ordained by God for the office of apostleship. And in order to do that, you can't come kick the doors wide open and get too aggressive. And you can't go in there asking for support and all other things. You just got to present the gospel gently, present it to them, give them some truth, give them some basic principles. And he showed he was always a man of character, integrity, especially with new churches, new believers. He did this by not approaching a new group of believers Seeking support first, but just bring them the gospel. That was it. Just gently bring the gospel into the area. You'll see who's positive and then feed those positive believers some pertinent doctrines like the filling of the spirit, going forward in God's plan, maybe a, a, a doctrine about grace. You explain grace to them, explain some things about the dispensational uh, issues that Paul was an expert at and bring that through the door first. You don't come in, kick the door open and be too aggressive and seek support and start giving orders right off the bat. Paul knew how to go into an area with new believers and gently present the gospel and let the church develop on its own. 1 Thessalonians 2.10 You are witnesses, he said, and so is God, of how devoutly and rightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. There comes a point, once you recognize the gift of pastor or anyone in leadership, you recognize authority, that you willingly submit yourself to that authority of what they're doing in their leadership role. You can't keep playing games. Once God establishes authority or leadership or a chain of command in your life and you recognize and realize God is at work, you then have to get under that authority. You can't keep playing games with the authority all the time. So Paul did it the right way. Now they showed in reciprocation of Paul doing things the right way, opening up, they became a congregation for him. 1 Thessalonians 2.11, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring, I went over those with you recently, each one of you as a father would his own children, verse 12, so that, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We covered really uh, verses 11, I believe 11 and 12, pretty well the last couple of lessons. The Apostle Paul fulfilled his calling as a man of God teaching the Word. He had even sent in Timothy behind himself to follow up with Bible doctrine for these new Greek converts. He always did that. He went into an area, that's why he traveled with different men. Whether it was Silas or Barnabas or, or, or Timothy, no matter who it was, Luke. And oftentimes he would go in with the gospel and establish a small group of believers. And then he could have one of his men come in behind him and teach Bible doctrine principles a few weeks later and to start developing a church in that area. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 is what we're going to look at today. For this reason, he writes, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. This is important, folks. Not as the word of mere men, but as what it really is, the word of God divinely inspired, which also is at work in you who believe. There's really a lot there in verse 13. The Apostle Paul was called by God to be the teacher of the Gentiles. The Lord and Savior Jesus Christ touched Paul in a very intimate way 
and ordained him to not only be the 12th apostle, but to be the leader in teaching mystery doctrine of the church age. Jesus Christ himself commissioned Paul face to face, took Paul aside in the heavenly face to face, and gave him portions of mystery doctrine that opened up the Old Testament and into this New Testament that he helped to write. The majority of the Jews had rejected the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the nation of Israel had bucked the authority of the word for thousands of years. It's all over the Old Testament. Now, in this new dispensation, it was time for the Gentiles to come into the authority of the word. That's what the transition was about as well. Part of mystery doctrine was the insertion of the church age, which interrupts the age of Israel. It's a big part of mystery doctrine. Church age inserted, intercalation it's called in theology, interrupts the age of Israel, meaning predominantly a Gentile church goes forward until the rapture. Now, there are Messianic Jews, meaning bloodline, real Jewish, full-blooded Jewish people that come to believe in Christ. They call themselves a lot of times Messianic Jews. But for the most part, predominantly, we have a Gentile church now, Church of Jesus Christ, into the rapture. These believers recognize Paul's authority. That's an important key principle today. These believers recognize the apostleship of Paul, his authority. They accept his teaching as authentic. In other words, whatever vetting went on, it was over with. It's fine to vet somebody, but it comes a point where you recognize that authority and get under it. 1 Thessalonians 2.14, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. In other words, you've gone through all the same things a lot of the Jewish believers have gone through. This is a gift when a pastor gets to a point. I'll tell you, this is true. I can speak from my own experience, and the man who ordained me told me this. This is a gift when a pastor gets to a point where he's teaching what God the Holy Spirit leads him to teach, and those under his authority begin to accept it and grow in that ministry. It's a gift. It's exciting to see. It's exciting to have that feeling. That's a good emotion. It's a response of happiness because you realize in your gift there are those that are benefiting from that gift the way they're supposed to benefit. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. We're going to tear this verse 13 apart a little bit to begin with this morning. A lot of this is very important. That's why we need to go um, and really tear this whole one scripture apart uh, a little deeper than I often do. Sometimes I have to do this where I have to go every, if it's a big scripture, every couple sentences I got to tear into it and really put it under the magnifying glass. This is important today. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 For this reason we also constantly thank God because of what? Serious believers in Thessalonica. Those who had a pattern, they're developing a rhythm, a pattern of study and follow-up. There's a grateful relief for the Apostle Paul, and that's written in the present tense. He really feels this way, and he continues to feel this way, and he's been feeling this way about this group. Even when he was down in Corinth, hearing things about this group, he felt this grateful heart, this response in his emotions, and it's in the, written in the present tense. Very thankful. That is why he writes, we thank God without ceasing, he says. Haven't stopped thanking God since I met you guys, he's saying. And there's those people I feel about. Listen, we went to the South Dakota conference recently. Some of the folks there, I feel this about some of the folks there. Paul is thankful because the Thessalonian believers responded to God's word. It's exciting. It's exciting for everybody when they respond and start even growing in baby steps, which is fine. We're on a journey, folks. It's not a 50-meter dash. It's a marathon. If you have established... A pastor teacher is teaching you accurately. Take your time. If you have established a pastor teacher is teaching you accurately, you only hurt yourself by continuation of taking that which he teaches lightly. You're the one hurt. When you first come under a teacher, you should take caution, absolutely, and vet that man. And more importantly, the message. Be careful of just vetting the man, the message. You will always find flaws and problems with the man. Amen. <laughs> the important part is the message. What's he teaching? 
It's about the message, not the man. Be careful you don't focus too much on little personality flaws or I heard he did this 20 years ago. Oh yeah, I can tell you worse. What's the message? What's the spirit leading this man to teach? If it is the word of God, and God the Holy Spirit is active in that ministry, then buckle down and study. Take it serious. If not, go find the teacher you know is ordained by God for you. Simply put, I'm going to repeat this whole thing. And pay attention, this is very important today. If you've established a pastor teacher is teaching you accurately, you only hurt yourself by the continuation of taking that which he teaches and teaching you and leading you lightly. You brush it off. You just show up once in a while, and eh, I don't know if everything he says is accurate, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of like, eh, have that brush it off attitude. You hurt yourself in the long run. When you first come under a teacher, you should caution. Take the caution. Vet that man. More importantly, vet the message coming out of his mouth from the pulpit. You will always find flaws and problems with the man. The important part is what is the message? If it is the word of God, and God the Holy Spirit is active in that ministry, then buckle down and study. Take it serious. Get into a rhythm and a pattern under his authority. If not, go find the teacher you know you're ordained by. That God is ordained just for you. Figure it out. But you hurt your own spiritual growth and walk with God when you do not accept the authority of the word from a prepared, ordained pastor teacher. You hurt yourself in the, in the long run, and it gives people an excuse. It gives them an out not to get into serious Bible study habits, which this message is about. Serious Bible study habits. Well, I don't know. When he taught something a couple months ago, it kind of bothered me. I don't like it. This other church I went to taught something different. Tear it apart. Figure it out. Do some extra homework. Check your notes. What did he teach you? What did that pulpit give you? If that meal was authentic and you can't... You can't buck against it except for your feelings. Then check yourself before you wreck yourself. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. How's that for some old school rap? Check yourself before you riggedy wreck yourself. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. You received the word of God which you heard from us, Paul writes. You accepted it. Now what he does here, he actually uses two Greek terms that talk to uh, what we would say welcoming somebody into your home almost. Becoming intimate with them. Paralambano, I've covered this one before in versions of this word. To receive or take hold. Fully grasp, it's actually a stronghold. Fully grasp or understand mentally and physically. To welcome in is a way to look at it. Because you bring it close to you. The other word you're looking at there is decomai. To accept or learn. Carry with endurance. So to receive and accept, the two words you're looking at, you received the word, you accepted it, you also heard it. There's actually three things going on there. Paralambano, to receive, to take hold of, to grasp, fully understand physically and mentally, to seize in a strong fashion, sometimes used by the military. Sometimes used by the military when a soldier caught up to somebody who was chasing and he finally tackled him and got him and got him close to him and pulled him in and got him, seized him. That's what it means. So it had a military connotation too. But it also had a connotation of welcoming or bringing somebody close. Deco by to accept. You're hearing it, you're accepting it, you're receiving it to accept. Deco by to sustain and carry what you learn. A little something different. Not only do you bring it in, but you have to be able to carry it. Sustain and carry what you learn. To accept, to sustain and carry what you learn. The words you received is an aorist active participle. The action of the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. And the main verb is given, you received. And the term you received is literally, you welcomed it in. You brought it in. You brought it into your house. You welcomed it in. You had an open heart and open mind. You welcomed it in. That's what this all speaks to. This is a good thing. These are people that are listening, believers, positive, that are listening. They're betting. They're checking the message, and then they bring it in. They don't keep playing games with it. They realize it's the Word of God. They bring it into their life. When they received or heard the Word of God, they welcomed it in or made it home within their soul. They had a dwelling place in their soul for Bible doctrine. All of us should. 
should have a library in there that you're filling up. You should have a doctrinal library you're building in your soul structure. The word receive is really mentioned twice here. The first time it means to welcome, and the second time it also means to welcome. It just has really two different Greek verbs representing it. You could look at it two different ways. You know, you tell somebody, welcome, and then you say, come into my home. You're welcome here. Make this your home. It's like two different statements meaning the same thing, really, if you tear them apart. Welcome and welcome. Come in. Greek verb, two, two Greek verbs representing pretty much the same thing. One actually means to keep carrying it forward, though. It also means a dwelling place. To welcome means bring it into your home, to embrace it, make it very personal. We just talked about fellowship recently. Fellowship with the Word. Bible doctrine is welcomed in and carried or made to dwell to find a home in your soul structure. Ask yourself, is Bible doctrine welcomed in finding a home and finding fellowship and finding a place to dwell in your soul structure? Is some kind of doctrinal library being built in you? These are good questions to ask yourself because that's what they were doing very early on, these believers. Pretty amazing. That's why Paul's responding emotionally in the right way to this group. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 then goes on to say, Not as the word of mere men, but as it what is really is, Paul says, what it really represents is the word of God, which also is at work in you who believe. And this is written in the present tense. It's not only at work, it's been at work, and it's going to keep being at work because you're positive believers. It's a good thing. This is a great verse. A very That one verse, if you skipped over, you don't realize what Paul's saying to them. How powerful this is for these new believers. They understood the difference between human viewpoint and divine viewpoint very early on. They got it. It clicked. The light bulb went off. Now, they weren't spiritual giants, but they just clicked. Some people click very early. They get it. They jump in. They fall in love with the word. Bible doctrine continues to work in them. Present tense. Apostle Paul saying, I'm seeing it. I'm already starting to see little pieces of fruit off your tree. So the word of God is at home, not as human viewpoint, but as divine viewpoint. Not as human viewpoint, but as divine viewpoint. Knowing that truth is singular, it's not plural, knowing that truth is singular, they make a positive decision for truth. They're looking at human viewpoint, they're looking at divine viewpoint and going, something's wrong with this one. It has some truth in it, but it's just tainted. This here is the purity of the Word of God. That's the singular truth that I really need to focus on because this one may have lies and does have lies and counterfeits mixed in it. They understood that very early on. The result is the Word of God is effective and moving forward in the positive believer's life. It means to be actively operational. It's a military term. Prepare to be operational and then actively operational. Actively operational means you're in the field. You're in the fight. You're going for it. You're moving forward when the bullets are. Preparation is important. You need to be prepared for operations, but that act to be actively operational is moving forward. You're in the brush firing. It is a present tense. Keeps on being actively operational. Keeps on going forward in spiritual warfare. When the Word of God works in us, it works for our benefit. That's why you cannot play games with the pastor and my schedule, and I don't have time for this, and I'll, I'll pick up next week's message later on. You've got to be careful with these patterns and rhythms you get into and excuses. It is in the present tense, he's saying, working in them, keeps on being actively operational. They're going forward in battle. When the Word of God works in us, it works for our benefit. The Word of God is the worker. The energy source is Bible doctrine. God's not asking you to come off the top of your head and start making things up. He's saying, I'm going to give you everything. Just get into the Word. Be open to it. Find the right path to teach it. Get filled with the Spirit. Understand the basic principles, the two power options, and get in it. The Word of God is the worker. The energy source is Bible doctrine. The Word of God is actively operational in those who believe. The Word is, is causing them to go forward. Because it was taken in with a positive attitude, filled with the Spirit, Christ-like nature, and it's circulating in them habitually. The Word's causing them to go forward and be spiritual warriors. 
All believers are called into operational functions with Bible doctrine as the energy source. You know, a lot of people drink uh, Gatorade, Red Bull, and all this garbage. The more you learn about it, the more you're going to say, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've been drinking that stuff. Trust me when I tell you. But all believers are called into operational functions with Bible doctrine as the energy source. No sugary energy source. Bible doctrine is the energy source. That's your Red Bull. The knowledge and the knowledge base and the guide for application is the Word of God. The energy source, the knowledge base, the guide, and the, the guide for your application in life is from the Word. If you are not under the property authority, the right authority of teaching of God's Word, that falls upon you, folks. That is your own responsibility. So if you've watched messages I've given recently, you say, wow, these are a little in-depth, or, you know, I came from a church that didn't really get into the original language, or this isagogic stuff he talks about, the ice principles, and the exegesis, and all this kind of stuff, then maybe you're under the wrong teaching. That's up to you to make a decision. But if you're not under the proper authority, maybe it's not me, maybe it's somebody else. If you're not under the proper authority of the teaching of God's Word, that will fall upon you. There's no one to look for. There's nobody to look for but in the mirror. It is your responsibility. And sooner or later, God calls us to stand in our responsibilities. All believers are called to follow the lead of the apostles. I don't think any pulpit would argue that. Any pulpit that teaches Jesus Christ accurately, <clears throat> even if they teach a lot of fluff. If you said to them, you went into a big denominational church or a church that speaks of Jesus Christ, and you said all believers are supposed to follow the lead of the apostles, I would say they would all agree, amen? If not, there's a big issue, there, a big red flag, not a little one. So if all believers are called to follow the lead of the apostle, certainly Apostle Paul for the church age, the apostles are established as church leaders who follow the footsteps of Jesus Christ. It's easy to see the lineage. That's your lineage, folks. We talk about lineage, and really goes back to the apostles and Jesus Christ. That's the protocol. Philippians 3.17 says, Brothers and sisters, believers, join in following my example, the apostle Paul writes, following what I'm doing, because I'm doing my best to follow Christ, he's saying, and observe those who walk according to the pattern, the rhythm, the habits, good habits you have in us, in the apostles. Philippians 3.18, for many walk of whom I often told you, now I even weep, he said, because a lot of them were Jewish brethren, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. They may have even believed at one time, but now they've gone back into religion or something else, and it hurt Paul's heart. That's a response. That's a good thing with the emotions, responding the right way. Listen, you get friendly with somebody, and you're having fellowship with them, and you know they understand Jesus Christ, they're a believer, then all of a sudden, you don't see them for two years, and you find out they're involved in a bunch of nonsense at some crazy big church down the road that's not teaching accurately, that hurts your heart. That's a response. That's okay. That's empathy and compassion for somebody. But they become enemies of the cross. Very sad situation. Join in following my example, Paul says. Watch what we're doing and saying. Observe those who walk according to this rhythm, this pattern, this habit. The apostles were not involved in denominational nonsense. I challenge you to find that. They took great pains in teaching the accuracy of the word. That's obvious. The apostles never got involved in huge emotional ministries anywhere. That wasn't their goal. They avoided that. They didn't get involved in foolishness. They actually warned against that. So think about these things. The apostles... Our Lord never got involved in emotional teaching. He really didn't. Other than a few times when he displayed perfect righteous indignation against the religious crowd, most of the time he was very, I would say almost all the time, very cerebral thinking and trying to give stories, analogies, and teaching principles in a calm, relaxed manner. Our Lord Jesus Christ made Bible study a time to think, to contemplate, to learn new principles, deeper truth. And the apostles took it to the next level. That was, it was given to them to take it to the next level for us. But notice, anyone who opposes the truth of Bible doctrine is an enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Ask yourself, were the apostles trying to set up big emotional ministries where people were rolling around in the aisles and prophesying all over and sweating and spitting and speaking in tongues? Was that what they were all about? Because I can show you any scriptures that tell you about tongues. I've explained those to you. That was for a certain period of time, for a certain thing. It was actually, most of it was related to the discipline for Israel. It goes back to the Old Testament. I've touched on that. Some of it had to do with evangelizing the people that spoke in a different language as well. But don't get caught up in all these big emotional ministries. The apostles didn't. Where do you find they were trying to set up denominational standards for people in big churches? You don't find these things. You don't. You don't see it with our Lord either. Other than some righteous indignation or a handful of times when his emotions responded the right way, he taught very calmly, deep principles, lessons that he wanted you to sit and study and pay attention. In a lesson on the reminder of what they had already been taught and the one ritual we continue in the church age, the Apostle Paul uses a repetition for the stumbling, bumbling believers at Corinth. He had to bring certain churches like the congregation at Corinth back down to earth because emotions always got the best of them. They were involved in a lot of cosmic viewpoint, a lot of problems. But in a lesson on the reminder of what they had already been taught and the one ritual we continue in the church age, the Apostle Paul uses repetition to the stumbling believers at Corinth. Look at 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 on the board. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. Be imitators of me. Right there. Just as I am also of Christ. I'm trying to follow what Christ taught me. Follow what I'm showing you. 1 Corinthians 11.2 Now I praise you because you remembered me in everything. And hold firmly to the traditions most of them did. Just as I handed them down to you now. The Apostle Paul had to always approach like you always do. With people that are immature and caught up in their emotions. A little bit gentle before you drop discipline on them. That's what he's doing. These traditions he's talking about are not part of the Apostle Paul's Saul of Tarsus. His past. It's not part of the Sanhedrin. That's not what he's talking about. Traditions he learned studying to be a Pharisee. These are verbal instructions, mystery doctrine. And preparing these folks for the one ritual, this one congregation, the one ritual in the church age we're called to do repeatedly, which I'll be doing sometime next week, the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper. That's what he's getting them back into, the mindset. But sometimes when people get off on track emotionally, you got to bring them down. And get them back into a rhythm of studying and relax. Don't let the emotions get the best of you. If they've gone astray, try to gently pull them back in. And Paul had to do this several times with the church at Corinth. This whole chapter is a preparation for the lesson on the Lord's Supper, actually. It's the one we use a lot of times for the Lord's Supper. There were problems with the chain of command and loose lifestyles, let's put it that way, among some of the congregation at Corinth. Problems with the chain of command. Once you buck authority and you don't have people in, in authority and those in authority are going astray or those under the authority aren't, aren't respecting the authority, the chain of command gets broken and there's loose living, loose lifestyle among some of the congregation, you have problems. Corinth had that. Bible doctrine is designed to teach, to guide, to give hope, to give strength, as well as to reprimand a lot of people don't want to hear that. And push believers towards spiritual maturity. Sometimes you got to reprimand and push them. Sometimes you got to come in gentle and then bring up the bad stuff. Sometimes you come right in and kick the door in and bring up the bad stuff. You have to know how to approach these things as a leader. Some people agree with the Word of God. They'll say, yes, I believe the Word of God. I know about it. But at the same time, you'll hear them. This is very common, actually, even amongst believers. They say they can't be sure of everything that God said, everything that's written down. And when you press the teaching of the Bible, like we're, the type of study we do that I do, and the men in my lineage, when you press that teaching of the Bible, they likely most times reply with something like this. That's just your interpretation. You ever heard that? I have. If you want to be a pastor or a church leader, get used to statements like that usually thrown at you from people who don't want to study. 
That's just your interpretation. I have my own relationship with God. Be careful of statements like that, especially coming from believers. It's a sign of one of two things. Either they're an immature believer and emotions are going to get the best of them, or they're not born again and saved and they're just checking the box, yeah, I'm a Christian. There are certainly some places where the word of God is hard to precisely interpret. I'd be a liar to tell you different. Yet, that becomes a calling for having an ordained pastor. What do you think you have pastor teachers for? When people say, well, that's just your interpretation, there's really only one way to interpret the Bible. You can get a lot of lessons from one scripture. You can learn a lot of principles. But you can't just all of a sudden spin in ten different directions and come up with five different doctrines, separate doctrines, from a scripture. It's not just your interpretation. There are certainly places in the Bible that may become difficult precisely to interpret, yet that becomes a calling for an ordained pastor teacher. The Bible has a clear calling for the authority of church leadership. You can't get away from it. The Bible has a clear calling for the church leadership. Believers reject the authority of the pastor teacher from arrogance or apathy usually, yet it cannot be denied. Doesn't matter if they're arrogant or they're lazy, whatever the attitude is, or they have their own way to interpret the Bible. Facts are facts. As I say all the time, you can argue that there's no moon and stars, but wait around long enough at night and they'll be up there. <laughs> Can't deny these things, folks. I have a bunch of scriptures. I'm going to go over them quickly. I want you to jot them down. If somebody wants to argue with you about having a pastor, teacher, and church leadership and the role that God ordains men to teach the word of God, I'm going to give you some. And actually, I can put a whole bunch more up there. I decided not to uh, get too crazy. Deuteronomy 27.9. Jeremiah 3.15. Amos 2.11, Luke 6.40, Matthew 28.19, Ephesians 3.7, Ephesians 4.11, Romans 10.14, 1 Corinthians 12.28, 2 Timothy 4.5. I'm going to leave them up there for a couple extra minutes. This is important to understand. Don't let people talk about, well, that's just their interpretation. I have my, my own interpretation. You really don't need a pastor. I would be careful of all that. You do what you want. You know, I push people to be critical thinkers. I want you to. But be very careful what direction you go in. If they come at you with these type of attitudes I'm showing you, give them these scriptures, and I could probably give you another 8 or 10. Easily. But these are important to understand. Deuteronomy 27.9, Jeremiah 3.15, Amos 2.11, Luke 640, Matthew 28, 19, Ephesians 3, 7, Ephesians 4, 11, Romans 10, 14, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 2 Timothy 4, 5. You do with them what you'd like. Take that and run with it. Right there are just a few scriptures that clearly point out the gift of pastor, teacher, or the calling of church leadership for a teaching ministry. Call it what you'd like. Church leadership, teaching ministry, pastor, teacher. But the call is there. God has put it down very early in the word of God. Go all the way back into Deuteronomy and start seeing that. You can go back into Genesis and I can show you principles there as well. Starting with Adam as head of household, Bible study teacher for the family. Now, Jeremiah prophesies a future tense of church leadership in the realm of teaching in Jeremiah 3.15. Let me put that one on the board. Jeremiah 3.15. Then I will give you, this is God the Holy Spirit speaking through Jeremiah the prophet. Then I will give you, future tense, shepherds after my own heart, who will feed you knowledge and understanding. Not emotional nonsense, not denominational dogma. Knowledge and understanding. Pastor teachers are a guide. Feed and teach knowledge. Not opinions, not popular ideologies or emotional nonsense. Let me say that again. This is written in a future tense. God the Holy Spirit saying, I'm going to bring forth in the future shepherds after my own heart. Into my own word, mind of Christ. Who will feed you knowledge and understanding. Pastor teachers are called to guide, 
feed and teach knowledge, not opinions, popular ideologies or emotional nonsense. That's why oftentimes if I come across a principle I'm teaching, I'll say, this I've been studying, this is kind of my own opinion on this because I don't have enough scripture yet to back it up, but I throw my own opinion occasionally, and I'm very clear when I do that. Very, very clear when I do that. You won't be confused, trust me. If you've been with me, you know when I say, listen, there's my opinion about something. This is what I see. This is what God the Holy Spirit reveals to me. You do it with it what you like. People can deny the office of pastor, teacher, deny the calling, but they are denying the clear call within Scripture. They're not denying me. They're denying God's Word. Jump over to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. I think that's what we're going to read as we close out. Ephesians 1. God has always put a calling on certain men to teach and speak His Word with clarity and accuracy. It goes all the way back into Genesis. Adam became responsible for teaching with clarity and accuracy what Jesus Christ taught him in the garden. It all revolves around the filling power of God, the Holy Spirit. Whether it is a pastor or congregation member, we all have to allow God to do work within us. You have to allow the Spirit to touch you when I'm teaching. I have to make sure the Spirit touches me when I put my notes together and as I'm teaching you. So I get filled with the Spirit before every message. I get filled with the Spirit as I'm working on my notes. And you should be filled with the Spirit as you take them in. We all have to have that. Philippians 2.13, Apostle Paul writes, For it is God who is at work in you, believer, both to desire and to work for His good pleasure. Not your personal opinions, not the popular ideology of the day, not emotional nonsense. It's His good pleasure, His plan, His will. His design. The work is spiritual, folks, not natural. It's not from the flesh. If it is, you have a problem. It first means we recognize the power of God, the Holy Spirit, and handle the word with accuracy. You have to understand those two principles. Power of God, the Holy Spirit, and taking in the word habitually and accurately. Very important. This letter to Ephesus we're going to be reading here was written by Paul from a Roman imprisonment in about 62 AD. Both Ephesians and Colossians were delivered by Tychicus, and I think it was Onesimus. Uh, he was believed to have carried the letter uh, to Philemon. But this is from Ephesians, and we believe Tychicus is the one who carried and delivered that one. Now, the way it's written in the beginning of Ephesians, in the original language, the original context of it, it really is more of an open letter to all churches. So Ephesians was designed to correct reversionism, not just in Ephesus, but throughout many churches. So it's an open letter, really, to a big problem of going backward instead of forward in the plan of God that was happening. It begins with the basic concepts of the plan of God for church-age believers, and then goes deeper into angelic conflict later in the chapter in the book, in the letter. Ephesians 1.18, pick it up right there. Put it on the board for you. Ephesians 1.18. We're just going to go over a few of these related to what I'm telling you today. Understanding the authority of the word and getting into a pattern or a rhythm of Bible study. Very important. Become imitators. The Lord taught daily in the temple. The apostles went around almost every day teaching and preaching. Ephesians 1.18. I pray that the eyes of your heart, Paul writes may be enlightened. What's he talking about? Your soul. It's not emotions. He's talking about deep in your soul structure. The eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints? The eyes of the heart, always, almost always in scripture, speak to soul structure. It's talking about how you think deep within that soul structure, meaning what's being constructed there again inside of you, in your life, your norms and standards, your ideologies, your thoughts, your beliefs, what's developing, what's being built in there, what type of library of doctrines going on in there, and what's changing, how's the word changing you, or are you trying to change the word? It's a good question to ask yourself. That's what he's talking about, deep within the soul structure. The word of God is designed to change you. 
We do not change the word to fit our desires and our lifestyles. That's the problems we're having today in the year of our Lord 2022. Because for about in America for the last 50 or 60 years, we've slowly started to take the word of God and either ignore it or try to change it to fit our desires and our lifestyles, to make us comfortable. The word of God is designed to change us. We don't change it. Your whole spiritual walk, spiritual growth, and problem-solving skills are all dependent upon your Bible study. That's a fact. Your whole spiritual walk, your spiritual growth, your problem-solving skills, all the things you want to learn and grow, discernment, all these things you want to reach for and have, they're all dependent on your Bible study. The context of your Bible study, the habits in your Bible study, the rhythms in your Bible study, the accuracy of your Bible study. Ephesians 1.19. He goes on to write, And what is the boundless greatness of his power toward us who believe believers? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Nothing from your flesh. Amen. Your union with Christ is designed for spiritual intellect, not emotional roller coasters. Spiritual intellect, spiritual power for this temporal battle that we're in. Your union with Christ. That's why I say take advantage of it. He wants you to. What do you think he gives it to you for? Your union with Christ is designed for spiritual intellect and spiritual power in this temporal battle. Yet, if the word is not handled in the right fashion, the right thing done in the right way, or it is neglected, the believer has only their flesh to rely upon, and that's where the church is today, the church of Jesus Christ. Large portions of it are in the flesh. They don't think they are, but they are in the flesh. Again, what is your rhythm? What is your pattern? What is your standard of Bible study? It's a good question to ask. I really enjoy putting that title on there because it clicked for me like a light bulb went off. A lot of things I've been teaching lately and I haven't talked about. What are your study habits? What are your study habits? It's like going to the gym. You, know, you want a great body, but you only like to go to the gym once a month. Oh, well. And you want to eat pizza and drink soda the rest of the week. I, I don't know what to tell you. It's the same thing, folks. Your union with Christ is designed for spiritual intellect and power. Not an emotional roller coaster, but you have to accurately handle the word and not neglect it. Otherwise, you're in the flesh. Ephesians 1.20 goes on to say, Which he brought about in Christ, God did this in his plan through Christ, when he raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Everything, folks, comes from our union with Christ. Center of the universe, cross of Jesus Christ, person and work of Jesus Christ. Everything comes from our union with Christ. Our Lord sat down at the right hand of the throne in victory, and many believers choose to live in defeat instead. That was a victory. When he sat that session, he sat down, that was the returning victor sitting down at the throne of royalty where he belongs. And yet, he had the victory, and many believers want to live in defeat. Many believers live like unbelievers. Many believers live like unbelievers. There's no one to blame but themselves, folks, in the end. Your, your choices, your free will, is on you. Ephesians 2.1 tells us what? Paul writes there, you were dead in your offenses and sins, your old sin nature. Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you previously walked. You already walked this way. You already tried that lifestyle. According to the course of this world, according to the prince and power of the air, Satan's authority, cosmic system, of the spirit, small s, that is now working in the sons of disobedience, all other unbelievers. Why do you want to go back to walking, doing the walking dead walk with them? That's what it is, a bunch of walking dead. And you want to go back and join that? You make daily choices for the kingdom of heaven or for the kingdom of darkness every day. As a believer, I'm talking. We do. We make daily choices for the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of darkness. And some days we fail miserably. Oh, well. Put a soldier out in battle for, for three or four months. I guarantee every day he's not a hero. Amen? There are two sides of this battle, folks. That's it. 
two sides of this battle. Many believers walk backward in this temporal life instead of forward in eternal victory. Walking backward in the cosmic system instead of forward in eternal victory, what's already been given to them. In the spiritual warfare, there is no middle ground, no gray area. At any given moment, you are helping one side or the other. <laughs> it is. You're either walking in the new nature or the old nature. You can't dance around that. You're either walking in the new nature or the old nature any given moment. Just simply how it is. Don't get freaked out by it. It's just how it is, folks. There's really no middle ground, no gray area you can play games with. That's what I love about the Word of God. If you really tear it apart, the right interpretation, you'll see. You can't really play games. Your Bible study habits, believers, will dictate your rate of spiritual growth. It's a good way to look at it. Very enlightened way to look at it. Your Bible study habits will dictate your rate of spiritual growth. Your Bible study content, the content, what you're getting, will dictate the depth of your spiritual IQ, which is very important. The importance of your personal rhythm, patterns of life, of Bible study, may be one of your most important habits. Really may be one of your most important habits, folks. If you have no consistent rhythm in your Bible study, you will have no consistent rhythm in your spiritual growth. Very simple, yet, yet deep principle. When I was thinking about this the other day, putting the title together and the notes together. The importance of your personal rhythm of Bible study may be one of your most important habits in your life. Really might be. If you have no consistent rhythm in your Bible study, you will have no consistent rhythm in your spiritual growth. Now, obviously, the content of your Bible study matters as well. I guess I could say you're better to have one, one hour class a week of really good, accurate Bible study than have two or three classes of singing, screaming, hollering, and slurping, and yelling. Amen? Or a bunch of fluffy stories from a skinny jean pastor. Just my opinion. If the believer can get into a serious rhythm of Bible study, filled by God the Holy Spirit, obviously, within a few months, I usually tell people, give it six months. Within a few months, they will begin to really gain ground in the spiritual walk. If you're serious and you want to take me up on this, start taking in the Word of God habitually. Take in, if it's not me, somebody else. But if it's me, take in my three hours of teaching a week. The days I'm not teaching, go over the, the message a second time or go over your notes. That way you get a second hour on the same subject matter. That'll give you six hours a week of Bible study. You do that seriously, fill with the Spirit, being serious, and go forward in the Word like that for six months. I guarantee you some strength in your spiritual walk, and I guarantee things are going to open up to you in a very special way. The consistency of your Bible study should be accompanied by, obviously, the filling power of the Holy Spirit. I think we understand that by now, if you've been with me, <laughs> I hope. If your rhythm of Bible study is done in the proper fashion, right thing, done in the right way, your hunger for accuracy in the Word will grow. It will. You'll say, well, I want to learn more. I want to understand that better. I want to go deeper into that. Emotional or fluffy surface teaching will leave you empty at some point and you will seek out a prepared pastor teacher. If you're, under, if you're serious and you're consistently getting in your word, even by yourself, you're going to get more hungry for the truth. And all the fluffy stuff is not going to fill you. If it does, there's a problem in your life, your spiritual walk. The fluffy stuff is eventually going to be like, I can't do this anymore. I need something deeper. I want to really get deeper into the principles. I want to learn, learn about the historical facts. I want to learn about what Jesus Christ and Paul meant by these statements that they said and what happened during this period of time and what this means to my spiritual life. What's the Spirit saying to me in my spiritual life? I don't want fluffy stories and emotional responses all the time. You will get hungry for the truth. Trust me. I appreciate your time. Please keep my family in prayer this weekend. I appreciate it. I'll see you next week. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. Father, bless these messages. Take them out to a lost and dying world, Father. And please put your hand on this new year and keep us safe and carry us through. Through your son's precious name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Happy New Year, Royal Family. Happy New Year.